back. We have the crew back and we have the Bitcoin morning brief. I will be hosting this morning, lucky enough to do so. And naturally, we have Tone and Jimmy on with beautiful backgrounds. A good to you first, Jimmy. Jimmy, how are you? I am good. It's morning where you are, Leah, but where I am, it's actually evening. And I think where Tone is, it's also evening. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's good to have you back. Uh, good to uh, you know, engage in the community news stuff again. So I'm looking very much forward to the show. Yay, me too. Yeah, we'll have a little birds chirping in the background so everybody can wake up to, to the tropics. Uh, Tone, the streaming man with 12 full <laughs> hours on that live stream that uh, Jimmy hung on to for quite a while and uh, was good fun. Tone, how are you? Ah, doing well. Uh, and uh, no, it's awesome to hear the birds in your background. And it's always evening where I am, Jimmy. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, it's great to bring the show back. I was just saying this morning, after that epic live stream for 12 hours, uh, I basically, after having some conversations with Jimmy and a few other people, came to the realization that these news shows and uh, the other things that I was doing before I got you know, into the rabbit hole of trading and finance is just so much more important to the world for years to come. Uh, no one needs another trader. I will keep doing, but there was a misunderstanding, guys. I will keep doing the technical analysis and price shows. That's not going away. But me actually physically trading, uh, that's going to be put on hold for years to come because this is just, I have a lot more fun doing this and it's just a lot more important. Uh, so now that I got that off my chest again, uh, let's get into the news show. Let's do it. And I will say, I agree. I have missed these a lot. I've learned so much from you guys. I will do a quick shout out to you, Jimmy, that your newsletters are incredible. And now that you've also, you do incredible jobs explaining all them underneath that I've uh, felt like we've been on the morning brief a tiny bit. So I've been uh, living vicariously with that one. But all right, we have a piece of yours here, and it says, for everyone that's not looking at the screen, Bitcoin having is here, how BitMEX is causing fees to rise. And this has definitely been a big topic that you, I believe, were the first person to figure out with the mempool. So what is this piece about? Uh, so it's uh, it's my newsletter that I send out every week. It has a bunch of news, but the lead story for this particular week uh, was the BitMEX, um, you know, like causing fees to rise everywhere because they do this giant dump of like 2000 or so transactions at 1300 UTC right around then. And uh, it's it's a bunch of multi-sigs that are horribly inefficient, not batched, not using SegWit. So, uh, you know, we debated it a little bit uh, with Loop Dash on, um, on the 12 hour stream. Uh, but I, I go through and explain exactly what's happening. It turns out that uh, the users on BitMEX are responsible for paying the fees um, and they aggregate them all and it ends up being about one Bitcoin a day, which is kind of incredible that they're paying that much in fees. But it causes the entire network to be clogged for most of the day, uh, especially because it happens at the beginning of the day US time. And uh, what ends up happening is that that lasts at least until 5, 6 p.m., often until 11, 12 uh, p.m. And that's, uh, that's not very good. Uh, they could be much more efficient and we could have a much better uh, Bitcoin network if they were to comply with the best practices. Perfect, thank you, Jimmy. And we will definitely be discussing the piece more thoroughly on the next show. So for everybody, this is on Jimmy's Medium page. And thanks so much for doing that, Jimmy, and all the tech talks. Yeah, uh, quick, um, quick, so just a quick please. comment on that. Uh, we are going to bring uh, the Understanding Bitcoin Tech Show, and I'll try to bring Luke Dash Jr. back so that we could like discuss this kind of stuff. I'm still, uh, I still can't wrap my head around his views on uh, maybe using SegWit is not a good idea for regular transactions. Uh, so we will explore that in depth. Just um, that's my only comment. Perfect. And the next story, also on a Medium page, but Reddit jumps into loot tokens with new cryptocurrency on Ethereum. Oh boy. Jimmy, turning it back to you for this one. What is Reddit up to? What are loot tokens? 
Uh, so loot tokens are apparently uh, ERC-20 tokens on the Ethereum network that they're issuing as a way to motivate their community members uh, to do something, I guess. Um, it's not entirely clear, but two subreddits, our cryptocurrency and our Fortnite BR subreddits, uh, now have loot tokens that you can earn through reputation and karma on Reddit. Apparently, there's a fixed limit. They say that there's only going to be 250 million of these coins, which will be used to uh, monetize some of their services. So uh, you can buy things with these tokens, uh, I guess like uh, Reddit Gold or something like that on uh, on uh, using this or maybe some Flare or something to that effect. Um, the two tokens are called Moons and Bricks, as you can see here. Um, and you can you can get them by getting reputation. Uh, it, this this is a clear money grab, and uh, and my personal feeling on this is that if you're a com a pub like a company that hasn't been into cryptocurrency before, and then you suddenly issue a token, it generally does not spell very good things for you because generally that means you're running out of money you couldn't raise money from normal investors and you had to go issue a token and what is this 2018 like they're two years behind as well this is like insane 17, that 17, they're doing 17. this so, yeah yeah i mean at, at least you know i'll give them the benefit of the doubt right like there were some tokens in 2018 uh, you know, like uh, I guess the Telegram token or whatever, but yeah, it, it's it's crazy that they're they're in this so late. But I I mean that may be speaking to how desperate they are to try to monetize the you know the site that they have, which obviously has lots of users, but they've had a very difficult time trying to get their advertising business to return like any sort of revenue. So this is their strategy going forward. Hey guys, are we are we actually streaming? I'm having issues. Uh, I uh, is, is my channel banned again? I'm I'm seeing it. I'm definitely I'm seeing it on YouTube. Um, some for some reason uh, it says video unavailable though when I when I click refresh. Right, and uh, the live chat is. Oh, but it, no, yeah, I can't I can't get to the live chat, but the video is there. So what the hell is going I, on? I see I my know. recording, at least from the camera. <laughs> so <laughs> at least I'll make sure I don't do too many bad things while you figure this one out. I'm gonna uh, I think it's on there. I'm gonna hit the record to my PC button here. It's uh I I also see it streaming, but I don't see the live chat. And I it's weird. I, I don't know what's going on in like the, the YouTube version. Uh, on, on Twitter, it says video unavailable. Yeah, that's uh, uh, that's strange. Jimmy, do you want to talk about the piece tone while you figure this out? Uh, sure, uh, I'll talk about uh, the piece. Uh, but I have a question for Jimmy about that piece. Oh, leave it right there. Don't scroll. Uh, scroll up a little bit, Leah. Or okay. actually, I'm sorry. I'm looking at the YouTube video, which is like on a one minute delay. So never mind. Uh, if you just scroll up just above the chart, just above the sure. decay chart, just above that. Yeah where it says that the tokens are limited to 250 million. Uh, Jimmy, as a blockchain developer, what limits these tokens to 250 million? Nothing, because it's an <laughs> ERC-20 token, so they can do whatever the heck they want. I'm sure they have some backdoor into their smart contract that makes it so that they could they, they could do whatever the hell they want. Um, and, and the thing is, like, it, it's it's such a strange economic decision because apparently it's supposed to some amount of tokens will pay for Reddit gold or something uh, now, but the amount later will be less because they're getting burned as they get used to buy oh, this that, stuff. You beat me to it, damn it! You beat me to it. Um, it, it yeah, the, the, the stupidity of the economics here actually get worse. Leah, if you now scroll down to their three points. What's, what's the economic model of the token? So their three points are amazing. We just discussed point number two with Jimmy that there is uh, absolutely nothing in point number two. Yeah, it's a little lower. It's just one of uh, the three bullet points. Yeah. Uh, there they are. They're coming up. Uh, yeah. We just discussed yeah. point number two that there is nothing limiting these tokens to 250 million. 
Um, now, point number one says the number of tokens issued diminishes over time and can only be earned from human effort. Uh, all future uh, human effort earns uh, tokens. They forgot to mention the part where Reddit, the company, will also retain a bunch of tokens. That comes later on in the article. Um, also, I love point number three. Uh, every time moon tokens are used to buy badges, uh, memberships, or whatever on Reddit, they are burned. So they are purposely destroying what could potentially be money. This is, uh, again, this is ridiculous. This, this was actually my, uh, my original uh, statement, and Jansef will never live this down when I said that supporting Counterparty was insane because they're burning Bitcoin, which made no logical sense whatsoever to me from day one. So many people were high on Counterparty, kind of went nowhere, of course. But um, I was like one of the few Bitcoin maximalists that didn't believe in Counterparty. Uh, and uh, uh, if you scroll down, uh, they also talk about how they're going to start pricing stuff, denominating it in moon tokens. And then magically, as these tokens get burned, they're going to arbitrarily lower the price in the denomination of moon tokens. It's right there. It's, I'm sorry, you went too far, Leah. It's right below the, the graph. It's right below the supply and demand yeah. graph, which doesn't really actually belong there because it's just like something out of economic textbook 101. Uh, so it makes no sense at all. So this is just, uh, they want to print their own money. Uh, this money will only be used on the Reddit platform, which means it has absolutely no economic viability anywhere. Of course, there's going to be enough crazies that are going to buy these tokens thinking that the Reddit moon coin will be the future currency of the world and everyone is going to use it for goods and services outside of Reddit. Uh, they obviously have to rely on moon, literally moon bag holders <laughs> uh, to buy this shit on exchanges. Uh, and of course, this does nothing but bloat the Ethereum blockchain, uh, bringing it one day closer to extinction, which I am, of course, happy about. Uh, there was one other minor point I wanted to mention somewhere, or I think that's the next link you're going to pull up. Uh, one of the Reddit threads already tried it, and it basically split the Reddit and forked the Reddit th thread. Oh, yeah, the not Grupal's uh, tweet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if, if, if that's next on your docket there, uh, the tweet that comes uh, along with this uh, news article. Uh, if not, don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. The other thing to remember about Reddit is that very early on, they actually hired Ryan X. Charles to do this very thing, except he couldn't figure out how to do it. And that caused him to be, uh, fi uh, well, I, I guess he left the company or was fired or something. They basically cut that entire department. And, uh, and this is what they came up with like four years later. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I, it, it just tells me that this is a company that doesn't move very fast and this wasn't very well thought out and that from an engineering standpoint, they chose possibly the worst, like combination of things. Uh, and it, I mean, it sounds like, uh, you know, you're, you're going to corrupt the community, uh, that, that tweet from not Google seemed to suggest that. Uh, you know, ETH trader split into two different ones because people were trying to go get those tokens and because they were economically incentivized to uh, do certain things, they, um, you know, it, it ended up making the community much worse. Um, yeah, I mean, th this is kind of uh, the wasp's nest of uh, bad incentive design that they're running into. Um, we'll see how it goes, but we'll be paying attention to this story going forward. The big FUD uh, that could and, happen is that, oh, yeah. Oh, no, I was going to say, and of course, uh, uh, Brian Armstrong couldn't wait to shill this token like he does every other token. <laughs> yeah, I love that he's uh, he's already shilling like uh, this token that, you know, I like, I, I get it. Reddit is like the world's seventh most popular site and, uh, or whatever. Uh, but he's trying so hard to stay crypto and not Bitcoin. Uh, you know, the, the tweet, uh, he, he had a tweet about this where he was saying, hey, crypto is just so amazing. Uh, you know, th this is going to be revolutionizing the industry. How many times have we heard that from ICO peddlers? Uh, I mean, just about every ICO is going to change the industry in some way. 
Um, haven't seen it yet. Tone and I are still waiting for our first one that will actually change something. The, the only scary thought on this is that when people say when moon, they could say now or yesterday. So hopefully uh, there's not too many, uh, too many scary ones of people talking about moon. Um, yes, that, uh, yeah. Okay, so our next story, firm with ties to former sheriff of Wall Street discloses 140 million Bitcoin fund. This is showing and talking about Lossky back in the news, selling $140 million of a previously unknown Bitcoin fund. Tone, what is Lossky up to? What is this news story? Well, uh, Wosky is back to, you know, doing what, uh, what he does, uh, tries to make the maximum amount of money. Uh, he was there uh, creating the worst Bitcoin and crypto regulation humanly possible out of New York, and then immediately quit uh, to form a consulting company, uh, charging you to get around the regulation that he created. And now apparently he's involved with a fund that sells you uh, Bitcoin. So talk about like normally this, this kind of nonsense kind of happens in reverse. Uh, normally you have uh, companies doing regulatory capture. This is the opposite. This is the regulator creating unreasonable regulation and then profiteering from the regulation that they created. This happens very, very rarely. So and Lossky, <laughs> deserve an applause. You, uh, uh, we may have to have another award it would be like the opposite of, you know, creating uh, a, a, an insanity blockchain like Vitalik Buterin, but in reverse. Yeah, I mean, I, and I, Jimmy, I, I don't know. Go ahead. What were your thoughts when you read? Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, it, it is kind of rare, at least in our industry, but it's it's common pretty much everywhere else, right? Like there, there's a bunch of people that were involved, for example, in, uh, in creating the healthcare legislation that are now consultants for healthcare companies to teach them how to comply with the very laws that they wrote. Um, so it, in a sense, this is a way in which uh, legislators or like, actually, these are more like appointed officials, um, you know, make money off of the regula regulations that they write is that they can leverage their expertise. It's, it's a form of post facto bribery. Uh, and that this is this is what, uh, you know, people like Lossky do is they uh, they rent out their expertise afterwards. So it's uh, it's post facto rent seeking, essentially. Um, it's, uh, I, I think, kind of a despicable thing to do to uh, essentially like make money, uh, you know, doing like adding really nothing to anyone. Um, but that's that's uh, that's unfortunately the reality of fiat money. Right. And for everybody uh, to remember, Lossky is credited as creating the bit license. And this piece does delve into all the various intricacies um, of what could be happening here, including this Stone Ridge Asset Management, a $15 billion advisor. And it definitely looks like everything the gentlemen are talking about here. So another banking story, JP Morgan is now serving crypto exchanges, Coinbase and Gemini being their first clients. Headline says it all. Tone, do you find this important? I actually do find it important. And uh, because JP Morgan was basically, and Jamie Dimon specifically, were so anti-Bitcoin at first because there was only Bitcoin and then eventually all of crypto. And uh, he's kind of right about the rest of crypto, but he was always wrong about Bitcoin. And I saw a tweet the other day that like highlighted every one of his statements uh, once a year uh, about how bad Bitcoin was. What is wrong? What is going on today with like technology? Um, and by the way, I'm still not sure if we are or aren't streaming. We only have 200 live viewers and some people say they can't find the stream and 250 people are watching. So it's just really weird what's going on. Sorry, but that's not our fault, guys. I'm sorry, that's YouTube. Anyway, back to the article. So um, I think this is really, really important. And this is, uh, it, it doesn't matter to the average person. Like to you or I, it doesn't directly matter. 
they're just providing banking services to Coinbase and they're providing bank services to Gemini. And eventually it'll probably be Kraken and some of the other regulated exchanges or at least exchanges that are doing their best to comply with regulation. Uh, and I think it goes a long way. It just cements uh, Bitcoin's, uh, I guess, foothold in the traditional world of finance. Now, the honey badger doesn't really care. Uh, Bitcoin doesn't care if it is or isn't accepted by Wall Street, but I kind of care uh, if uh, the government decides to make Bitcoin illegal. And uh, once again, we can talk about all we want that the honey badger doesn't care that the US government criminalizes Bitcoin, but in reality we do. Uh, I'm watching videos right now from all over the country, well, mostly just the over socialist states like New York and California, where if you go outside without a mask, you can get tackled by eight police officers, even if you're a female, uh, you know, holding the hand of a little child. And uh, as much as we can say that we don't care, uh, in reality, nobody wants to get arrested for making a Bitcoin transaction, just like no one really wants to get arrested for smoking a joint. And... Uh, criminalizing uh, something like Bitcoin, like criminalizing marijuana, you know, does destroy people's lives. And some people uh, know this is insane, but they're not gonna take a risk. Like, like I know it's insane to force people to walk around with a mask on, but at the same time, I don't wanna spend a week in jail. So I'll be walking around with a mask on if I go outside. So there is a limit to, uh, uh, to what you do. I know it's easy to say that you got to stand up and protest, uh, but at the same time, I think I can do more uh, by running the show than spending a week in uh, you know, jail. Uh, if I had a government job where I was getting paid during this whole thing, then it really wouldn't matter <laughs> where, where I spent that week. Anyway, I'm getting off tangent here. So I think this is, this is going to be important long term, and uh, it just makes it that much harder to demonize Bitcoin by the US government and law enforcement. And I think that's important. Jimmy may not agree. <laughs> Thank you, Tone. And I do agree in a certain way that it is extraordinarily difficult to get banking license for my friends that have started various hedge funds. Silvergate has had a bit of a monopoly. So I do find this a, a very interesting story. Jimmy, what, were you, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, so first of all, I'm, I'm uh, hearing reports that YouTube has been down or was down for a few minutes, just all across the board. So it wasn't just our particular channel. It was no, just, it's not uh, a conspiracy against crypto yeah. YouTubers, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Apparently, uh, if, you, if you look at Down Detector, you, uh, you find out, okay, there's a lot of people reporting YouTube is down um, in the last 40 minutes or so. so yeah, and we just, uh, and we just jumped. Uh, and we just jumped to 700 viewers and we were under 200 like five minutes ago, so. Okay, yeah, so they're, they're, uh, so apparently it's back, so it's, it's good now. Um, as far as this story goes, the, the significance for me isn't necessarily like, uh, you know, like uh, the government uh, not being able to ban Bitcoin. Uh, the significance is that basically every Bitcoin company in the United States has had to use Silicon Valley Bank because they were the only bank uh, in the U.S. that was willing to service Bitcoin customers. Um, the fact oh, that Jimmy, JP look, Morgan... Yeah, sorry, sorry, Jimmy. Sorry. Uh, signature Bank. Oh, is it Signature Bank? No, Silicon Valley yeah, yeah, yeah. Bank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the fact that JP Morgan is coming in uh, tells me that uh, the risks on Bitcoin stuff has uh, reduced for them enough to get there. Or it could be that they're feeling some pressure because... Uh, you know, there are um, bank like entities in Wyoming that are willing to service a lot of these companies and so on. So it, it's uh, it's very possible that what we're seeing is that, uh, you know, things are getting better uh, for Bitcoin as an ecosystem and that there are going to be more options going forward for a lot of these companies that are trying to make it in the Bitcoin space, which I think is fantastic. I want more competition against uh, you know, more exchanges, more mining pools, more uh, 
you know, mining companies, uh, maybe even mining manufacturers and things like that. Uh, there's a story earlier that we're not going to cover, but uh, which I had read about how TSMC might open a factory in Arizona. That would be fantastic because that would mean that chip manufacturing can now be done in the United States, at which point we could have uh, possibly mining manufacturers be in the United States. And that would mean that more mining would be in the United States. Uh, and that would be fantastic. So um, I'd like to see, uh, you know, this, this is just sort of like one of the many steps that would need to happen for that to happen, but I, I welcome it and I hope more banks give Bitcoin, uh, you know, people more services because uh, that fiat on ramp is pretty critical to most people. That makes sense. And especially in light, I was thinking in light of the current economic situation, JP Morgan Chase has had some of the most pessimistic uh, projections for the economy. It could be interesting that they may see this as a very valuable potential revenue stream and, and want to make sure that they're on it, which would be very bullish Bitcoin. So it is very interesting. Tone, you had mentioned this tweet. Do you want to speak to it? Uh, yeah, no, this was great. Uh, can, can you just play it from the start? It's very short, so less than a minute. I, I, I thought it was great. Oh. I don't think we're getting the audio. Yeah, no, I'm not getting the audio either. Governments would try to stop the currency being a Bitcoin currency, but be a, a technology. But there would be entrepreneurs who would kind of run a shadow economy system based on Bitcoin. So how would you see that play it's out? Not, it's just not going to happen. I mean, you're wasting your time. So you think when the do DOJ it? calls someone up and says that's an illegal currency, it's against the laws of the United States of America, if you do it again, we'll put you in jail, it's over. So you really no, think there's no that? issue. There will, and this is my personal opinion, there will be no real non-controlled currency in the world. <laughs> there's no government that's going to put up with it for long. Anybody they, it, it's kind of cute now. You know, A lot of the senators and Congress will say, I support Silicon Valley innovation. There will be no currency that gets around government controls. <laughs> the governments would try to stop the currency. Well, that, that was telling for sure. Uh, Tone, it looks like you want to make some comments. That does play into my point in that in the beginning, Jamie Dimon saw it as the government will never allow uh, a currency that gets around government controls. And now he's opening bank accounts for a currency that, gets ar that can get around government controls because it's like no government controls it. So by Jamie Dimon doing that, he's basically, he probably got the green light from the regulator saying that, yes, they admit that they're not gonna stop, be able to stop Bitcoin, or at least maybe they think they do, but that would be crazy. And uh, that phone call, uh, you're gonna get arrested if you use it, is not coming, uh, which is good. And that's very, very important. Uh, and I, I find that important. Thanks, Tone. Jimmy, also, why do you think Jamie Dimon is doing an about face? Uh, and, and money, it's baby, it's money. Know. This is a client, <laughs> and it's a big client. Yeah, I, but uh, as you said, Leah, I, I think he's very pessimistic on the economy, or uh, the entire JP Morgan Chase Bank is. Um, they might see this as one of the possible ways to hedge against the coming craziness or economic downturn that's uh, bound to happen. And they want to get into the front of the line. I mean, having, uh, you know, clients like uh, Coinbase and Gemini, that's not a small thing. There's a lot of money being transferred. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of money to be made doing that. So uh, I, I imagine if this goes well, that they, that the turnabout will be complete, but, uh, but, you know, at least they have some plausible deniability. Oh, it's just like so, sort of something we're trying if it doesn't succeed. But I suspect that it will be really, really successful. That makes a lot of sense. Also, for a note here, um, Coinbase and Gemini have applied for applications, banking applications here in Singapore. It came out at least publicly and they were, they were uh, job hunting on LinkedIn. So... I think that you know there's there's a lot to this story, um, and also also to your point, maybe J.P. Morgan Chase wants to make sure that that they're getting 
the, the majority of this before potentially Coinbase and Gemini look look elsewhere. But mm -hmm. definitely. Um, and we have Cobra. Cobra is leaving Bitcoin.org and we'll be passing it on. Jimmy, how do you feel about this? Yeah, so uh, Satoshi, when he left, he uh, he had the Bitcoin.org domain and passed it on to Cobra. Um, and Cobra, I think, uh, you know, uh, he, he's been doing this for a long time and now finally is sort of passing the torch on. <clears throat> um, I, I, I mean, I don't I don't blame him like there. There's been a lot of sort of. Uh, you know, drama around Bitcoin.org, what wallets, uh, you know, Bitcoin.org was recommending. Uh, Bitcoin Core took out its own domain because, uh, you know, there, there was some conflict. Uh, but overall, I think Cobra's done a pretty good job of making sure that it has the right kind of content. Uh, a lot of stuff about the actual development of Bitcoin and like educational material and how things work and things like that. So um, good on him to know that, you know, the, the right thing to do is to pass it on to somebody that will take good care of it. Um, and that's what this pull request on the Bitcoin.org GitHub is. It, it's uh, okay. Well, um, you know, I have a couple of people in mind, but if you have any other suggestions, please let me know. Um, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, I, I've had my differences with Cobra in the past. Um, but, you know, I, I, I still think he's done a pretty good job uh, considering like how like sort of haphazard the transition uh, to him getting the domain was and, um, you know, all the things that he's had to deal with over the years. So uh, very, uh, very thankful that um, that he's choosing to do it this way. And, uh, you know, best of luck to him. Uh, I, I believe he's still pseudonymous. So, um, you know, maybe this is a way to increase his OPSEC as he goes into a Bitcoin future. Thanks, Jimmy. A note is that for everybody when they read this, I found this to be a really nice note that he wrote. Just, uh, I, I thought that it was written very well. Objectively speaking, I thought it was kind, but I don't have the background that you guys have at all. Um, Tone, follow up. Sure. Uh, well, before I follow up, I got a question for Jimmy. Has Cobra made it public which people he's considering? Because that's the big question. Yeah. So uh, if you could scroll down about halfway, David. Uh, so David Harding has been um, uh, like go a little bit more down there. There it is. Uh, so David Harding has been uh, contributing to Bitcoin.org for years, and he's the one that had some conflicts with Cobra. And he suggested that wh uh, whoever has contributed the most to uh, Bitcoin.org should get uh, should get it, and he suggested the three people there, um, according to the number of commits, is Will Bin, Savon, and David Harding. Um, and and uh, and if you scroll down a little more, what uh, what Cobra replies uh, is, you know, current active contributors like Will Bins and Craig Watkins are already among the people I had in mind. So um, I think that's what he's thinking is to give it to the people that have contributed to Bitcoin.org the most, uh, which is the logical thing to do. But, you know, he, he wanted to make sure he got more input. Uh, somebody later on suggested Greg Maxwell. Cobra didn't think that Greg, Greg Maxwell would be interested. Um, but then somebody found, dug up some old uh, Reddit comment that suggested that he might. So who knows if that would happen um, Matt Corallo later on, or well, somebody else suggested, okay, well, maybe you could give it to uh, the Linux Foundation or the Electronic uh, Freedom Foundation. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, but Matt Corallo later on uh, says, hey, like those are kind of political organizations, and they're not going to know the ins and outs of Bitcoin. So I would strongly suggest that it go to an individual that could be trusted instead. So. Uh, we'll see where this goes, and uh, but yeah, there's plenty of time for Cobra to make his decision because Cobra said he's not going to do it until the end of the year. So um, this this is more a preliminary thing. I suspect it'll probably be going to uh, Will Bins or Craig Watkins. Okay, I'm not too I'm not too familiar with their work, but I'm assuming you approve of those choices. Uh, I mean, they, they they have the most commits for Bitcoin.org and the uh, content on Bitcoin.org is absolutely fantastic, especially like a lot of the developer resources and things like that. Uh, I know David's also contributed a lot and, uh, and the community owes a lot to them. 
uh, for creating that kind of documentation because it's it's uh, it's very thorough. It has a lot of good examples, and um, you know, I mean, most of the drama was around like what wallets it was recommending and things like that, which uh, which I, I I don't think is nearly as important as like the actual educational material. One more follow up, Jimmy, and thank you. Do you, how do you feel about the fact that handing it over to someone like Will Bins, et cetera, they're not pseudonymous? Do you think it's important, mm. like Cobra, we don't know his name, maybe someone here does, I do not, um, but we would know these people's name and that they are the ones that are taking care of this? Good question. Yeah, um, I mean, ideally, everyone would be <laughs> anonymous, but uh, like privacy is just so, so difficult. And, uh, and uh, it's uh, for, for some people, especially like, uh, like me, you know, like I, I don't, like it's part of my brand to be known and that keeps me more accountable. So in some ways it could be good because if you know that, you're going, uh, you know, like you have to behave well in or uh, otherwise, like people will like absolutely roast you and you might have a really bad time as a result. Um, for other people, like they don't want that kind of burden, but then they have the burden of uh, uh, OPSEC, which is not trivial, especially online. So, um, yeah, I mean, I know Tone has kind of like a pseudonym, but like it's it, it can be difficult to manage. So. I, I don't, I, I think it's, it should be up to the individual and, you know, um, it's, it's fine if uh, Will and Craig are not pseudonymous. Thanks, Jimmy. Uh, um, I, yeah. I got, no, I got a follow up question for Jimmy. Um, wh what would you say if it was more like a, like a multi-sig situation? Let's say uh, you hand it off to maybe five people and then you need three or five to agree on future changes to Bitcoin.org, or maybe seven of 10. Uh, and then you need some even bigger majority to say, kick someone out. Or uh, what do you think about that structure? Yeah, I think that's all being discussed right now. Um, and, you know, certainly like, I, I don't know if Cobra would give it to a single person, but maybe like, the combination, if, if it was just Will and Craig, for example, then it would probably be like a two of two multi-sig situation uh, for like uh, the commit access to um, to Bitcoin.org or something like that. Um, and there, there's the domain. So there's like some sort of DNS, um, uh, you know, that has to point to an IP address. So somebody has to control that. Um, it could be a multi-sig situation in some, some way or another. Um, but uh, some sort of foundation or organization and um, like that, that's, I think, certainly on the table. Uh, and uh, that's probably why he opened the issue, because it's, it's not obvious that if you just hand it off to a single person, that it's a great idea because you have a single point of failure. If you have at least multiple people, then, you know, maybe something can be done. And, you know, like pe people have there, there has been drama around Bitcoin.org and it was centered around Cobra Bitcoin because, he was almost unilaterally in control of it. Um, I, that's not to say it wasn't good, but like there, there are certain things that I think the community might want. Um, the the real question for me here is like, who actually owns this domain? Does it belong to the community? And if so, like, how do you manage it as a community? If it belongs to a person, then who has it? And um, these are all like not obvious at all. Um, Satoshi registered this domain and gave it over. So. Um, it's part of his, uh, his, uh, Satoshi's legacy, and um, it's not entirely clear what should be done about it, which is why he opened the issue, and I bought him for that. All right, I got, uh, sorry, I got, I got just one quick, I, I also had my run-ins with Cobra, but they were uh, more recently, and I even forgot what they were about. I know we uh, mostly disagreed on a couple of things, and I think they had to do with shit coins like BSV or mm. big blocks. Like I'm, I don't even remember. Uh, I mean, the Cobra was, uh, I'm not that familiar uh, that, that uh, I didn't have many run-ins with him. When I did, it was usually, you know, over shit coinery. So my view of him isn't as high as many of the other people that have been around Bitcoin longer than me. 
but like I said, Cobra, you've done a great job uh, from uh, uh, throughout your history, even though we had some run-ins. Thank you, Tone. And the thing is, though, Satoshi is live and well, right? So uh, as for the next story, Tone, you've done <laughs> great research on this. Is Adam back, Satoshi? Um, yeah, so, uh, hey guys, so I will be, I spent the entire day, uh, like diligently listening to every second of all three of these videos. And I will be bringing you like a one to two hour, oh, maybe not two, but like a, like a full episode, just kind of, uh, talking about this video series. And I will do it tomorrow. I know I need to do it sooner than later, but I'm going to do it tomorrow. I don't think I can do another video tonight. Uh, it's not going to be, well, you know, I'm not going to give away the, the point of it. I was chatting to Adam back all morning as well. The moment I got off the morning stream, I was immediately like going back and forth with Adam back. It's probably why he didn't join us for the having, which is unfortunate uh, because he didn't want to deal with this nonsense, obviously. Uh, but I do have... Uh, uh, some uh, interesting thoughts on this whole situation. Uh, so I'm not going to say anything else now. And we will just uh, deal with it tomorrow when I do a special stream on it. I'm not sure if or who are going to be my guests for that stream. But uh, my thoughts on this will be fully tomorrow. But I'll let Jimmy uh, have his say. And also, uh, before I give it off to Jimmy, uh, Leah, I just sent you an article that is like literally... There is a bill being voted on in the Senate. So what we talked about in the prior story of losing uh, privacy on the internet, it's gonna, it's about to like reach uh, level twenty. Uh, let's put it that way. Uh, but go ahead, Jimmy. Yeah. So this this is an interesting. I I, I did watch uh, all three parts of the series per Tone's suggestion yesterday. And uh, sorry, sorry, yeah. Jimmy. I apologize for that. I apologize. For <laughs> that <laughs> well thankfully the guy spoke really slowly and i have a, a an add-in to youtube that lets me go at 3x speed so i was able to make it through pretty fast but it, it is um let uh let's just say that it, it has some biases and uh, i might show up on the stream tomorrow for tone show and I'll give you my thoughts on it then, but I'll, I'll let you make your own decision. I, I, I don't necessarily recommend you watch all of it. Uh, some of it is a little bit infuriating if you know actually what happened. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, uh, there, there are like, it, it, it was confusing me a few days ago when Adam back started tweeting about how he's not Satoshi Nakamoto, um, knowing that this, uh, this video came out a few days ago. Makes makes sense. Uh, why? Uh, Leah, can, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I can't take anymore. Can you just go to a different part of the video? I don't want to stay there and give it a drink. <laughs> like anything else, or like at any other clip. Yes. That is you. not <laughs> a great face either, right? Like. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Thanks, thanks, Jimmy. Uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing both your guys' thoughts. Quick, provocative question. So did Roger potentially fund this type of thing? Uh, well, it, it, it has his, uh, you know, like footprint all over it, uh, but there's obviously no evidence. Um, I can, uh, but I will say I'm already given away what we're going to talk about tomorrow in full. Uh, let's just say I can make a, uh, a better argument that Roger funded this video than the video made that Adam Back is Satoshi. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there there are certain things that uh, well, Tone and I have both debated Roger, and we know the same points that he brings up over and over again. Let's just say a lot of them have a prominent place in the video, which suggests that there was some funding by Roger, but uh, there's no conclusive pro proof, obviously. Uh, uh, but 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 here but here here's the best part. It was like it's funny that you asked this question, Leah, because uh, as I was going back and forth with Adam back and also Jimmy on this earlier today, you know, like five minutes apart, both of them independently messaged me. It feels like Roger funded the video. Like, <laughs> it was just really funny to come through on my telegram from them independently. <laughs> Thanks, Tone. And Jimmy, please, the weather report is back and wow. 
Yeah, uh, so we're we're getting some clogging there. Uh, there there seems to be a lot more demand for transactions. Uh, I'm, I'm sure this has something to do with the price, which Cone will get into. But yeah, there there's definitely uh, you know a lot more transactions happening right now. Um, the the blocks are coming in fairly regularly, and you can see that whenever there's like a little spike down, those are blocks being found, and they're being found on a fairly regular basis, almost uh, faster actually than uh, than what would normally be, which is about six blocks per hour. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, right now you're gonna have to pay in the on the order of 150 to get in the next block for certain. Um, there's a there's another uh, website that you can go to that I, I want to let the viewers know about. Uh, Leah, if you could go to mempool.space. Yeah, that's right. And uh, and this this is an excellent site for fee estimation if you want to know about it. And what it does is it tells you the next block right now has an average of 157 sats per byte. Um, the block, and then there's enough for multiple blocks up to 67, 66 plus four. So seven, there's 70 blocks worth of uh, transactions in the mempool right now. If you, if you, uh, it, but uh, the block after would be have an average of 139 and so on. So you, you can kind of see like visually here what you need to pay in order to get in on a particular block. If you scroll up, Leah, there's a link at the top uh, for graphs and it looks very much like the other graph that you saw. Um, graphs. Uh, graphs, no, on top. Yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. Um, and th this is uh, sort of like an inverted version of the Jachin Bitcoin uh, one, where the high fees are at the bottom and the lower fees are at the top. So um, if you click on the 24 hour in the upper right, Leah, you can you can see sort of like where the mempool's been in the last 24 hours. Um, you can see that a lot of the uh, the lower uh, lower fee ones are not clearing because there uh, there haven't been enough. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's just more transactions on the network, probably due to the price rise in the last 24 hours. So, uh, but uh, let's go next to Coin Dance, and we could talk oh, about. Oh, no, 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 yeah, so so this tells me that wow, like the really cheap transactions haven't cleared uh, in quite a while. I don't like the fact that they're using European dates because I'm not used to those. Uh, <laughs> and um, so, hey, Jimmy, so we got so much to cover on our upcoming understanding Bitcoin tech. And mm -hmm. uh, this will probably be our very first topic to dive into this in depth. And the mm -hmm. biggest question is, I mean, I'm taking payments uh with uh i mean i i i gotta double check my stores and stuff uh but i'm taking payments and i'm not waiting for confirmations uh like at which point do transactions drop off the mempool and i get kind of scammed uh well so i mean depending on what good or service you're you're delivering if you're if you're sending them like physical bars of gold uh yeah you might get screwed not exactly but the if tone, it's not, not exactly the tone based business uh, they immediately get a link to a video <laughs> that I can't exactly take back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, it's possible you could get scammed. Generally, um, it, it depends on like, uh, you know, the, the size of the mempool. Like there's no one mempool, right? There's multiple mempools. Um, every node has its own mempool and it's whatever transactions that you've heard about that haven't been included in a block. Now, there, there's a setting on your node that you can set for how large you, you set your mempool to be. Um, so right now it's about uh, 80 megabytes of uh, or 70 megabytes of uh, data in the mempool that hasn't hasn't been included in a block, which is why the fees are kind of high. Uh, but uh, if you if you set it to 50, then like 20 megabytes of it would not be in your mempool because the lowest 20 megabytes of it would just drop off. Um, but depending on what what your setting is, I think the default setting is 100 megs. I'm not sure, uh, but whatever oh, so, it is. Oh, it, oh, so it's it. Uh, oh, wow. Okay, we gotta save this for the tech show, man. So uh -huh. I get to control how long someone else's transaction coming to me stays in the mempool 
only if I'm running my own node. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, well, so somewhat. Um, so there, I think there is another thing where if it's in the, it's been in the mempool for a long time, it might just be considered stale and it might get kicked out, uh, kicked out. And those tend to be low value transactions anyway. Uh, but yeah, generally, if you're running your own node, you can you can set your mempool uh, to be however large you want. So um, if you have the space, you could keep a gigabyte of uh, of transactions. Now the mempool doesn't hasn't really ever gotten that big, but okay. So, so this uh, is, but you so could this, do it. Okay, no, no, Jimmy, I'm gonna we're gonna dive into this. I don't want to take up more time on the show, but like I didn't know. I mean, I look, I am running BTC Pay server. I am running it on my own node. I am running it on my own server. Uh, but I am not actually. I'm not technical enough to actually do that. Like this is why I pay a web <laughs> developer uh, that understands databases really, really well and can code. Uh, and my developer manages that. Uh, so when you say your mempool, I didn't know I had a mempool. I thought the mempool was, you know, like the blockchain kind of thing. I thought it was uh, a general thing, like cumulative. But uh, but you're saying each node has delegated space of unclear transactions and all of them combined is the mempool and then each of them individually is a mempool. Yeah, yeah, basically. Uh, so um, like it, it's called the mempool because it's in memory and it hasn't been written to disk yet, right? Like so uh, when once, once it gets combined into a block then you clear those things out of the mempool and they go on to disk um, into your blockchain that's on disk. So that that's uh, that's that's where you get the name mempool. It's it's quote quote unquote in memory because it hasn't been written to disk. Although you know, like if you're uh, caching it, if you restart your node, it'll often write it to like a cache file and then reload it. And uh, you know, as it gets new blocks, it'll clear clear it out of there, so it keeps like a record. Uh, but but the it's uh, it's essentially like kind of like RAM on your computer. It's it's like the working space uh, by which uh, you know the Bitcoin stuff. Uh, you know all the transactions are sort of temporarily stored until they find a permanent home in the ledger. All right, I'm oh, sorry. Now, now we can move on. Yeah, we're gonna yeah. The, the the tech show is so badly needed, and uh, <laughs> we're gonna dive into that. Yeah, and I'm gonna okay. show my stupidity, and I'm happy to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so Jimmy, I asked you about this. Um, there's uh -huh. a lot of FUD in the space regarding miners. We are coming on the back of having. Can you explain what is going on? What's changing yeah. with mining? What is going on with yes. Coindance? Yeah. So th this is. Uh, so when we were doing the show tone uh, with the uh, with the Bitcoin having or like right, be I, I think it might have been the night before when we were doing the price show. Uh, we we showed this graph and we saw that uh, Bitcoin had something like ninety eight point five percent. Bitcoin Cash had like 0.7 percent, and Bitcoin SV had like 0.9 percent, something like that. Right. Right. And, and right. But, but I checked. I sorry. I, I checked this website like a few hours ago. And Bitcoin hash mm -hmm. rate was at maybe 95%. Sorry, Bitcoin no. was at 95%. And Bitcoin cash was all the way to like four and a half. Uh, but now Leah is showing it as 1.4. That seems to be yeah, very, so very dynamic. I think it's like just bad calculations. Are they not like averaging? Or are they using only like the last eight blocks or something? Well, so like I think they should be a little more stable than that. Well, so so here's the thing: hash rate is always an implied number. You have no idea how many, uh, how much actual hash power there is, or how many hashes are being calculated, because essentially you have to calculate that number based on the number of blocks found, and then you can figure out the implied hash rate based on that. So, um, so it, they might have had a little bit of a lucky streak, or it could have been that during the time that you checked that uh, B BCH has a dynamic uh, difficulty adjustment algorithm. So it might have been very profitable to go mine there. So there might have been a bunch of miners mining BCH for a few hours and then just jumped off. So it very well might have been like a few percent um, that's reduced. But uh, the, the point here is that like be when we did the show last time and showed this, um, Bitcoin's reward was at 12 and a half, BCH was at 6.25, BSB was at 6.25, and they had sort of like proportional hash rates. Um, and uh, the BCH 
uh, hash rate has a roughly doubled. BSV has increased just a little bit. Uh, but you could see that you know Bitcoin is absolutely dominant here, and that like they haven't uh, a tiny bit has gone over to BCH and BSV, but not very much. Yeah, Leah, uh, so if you, you might scroll it down, Leah, you might scroll yeah. down a little bit. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So keep Sorry. scrolling down, and you can you can kind of take a look at. Let's take a look at the so number the of blocks. Last two hours. Through. Yeah. The the last two hours. How many blocks yeah. have been mined in the last? Yeah. So two you hours. could you could see that uh, the last couple of hours uh, we found we're at block six three zero four zero three. We found uh, thirteen blocks yeah. in the last two hours or so, which is yeah, about, looks good. I mean, Bitcoin. Yeah, that, very that's a little faster than ten minutes per block. So. Um, and that's been the the case. The hour before that found like nine blocks. The hour before that found like seven blocks, something like that. So we're we're actually like a little faster. So there there was this myth of minor death spiral that they, it would no longer be profitable. So all these miners would shut down their miners. Um, that's not how the mining industry works. Uh, they they have very long term contracts and. They have capital equipment that they've amortized over a very long period of time. And the electricity tends to be a very small part of the cost, especially because the capex on the mining equipment, it tends to be so high. Uh, so we're not seeing any mining death spiral whatsoever. If anything, uh, the, the hash rate on Bitcoin seems to be very strong. I think it's still over 100 exahashes. Um, and it doesn't seem like it's going to slow down, especially with the price rise that's happening. Uh, it makes it more profitable. Um, and, you know, the, this is an economic reality that uh, miners have known for four years. So uh, based on that, they seem to have planned for it very well. Yeah. So not only is the uh, Bitcoin price helping to keep these miners in business, so is BitMax, because at current uh, stature of the mempool, BitMax will be paying more uh, eventually <laughs> than the block reward at this pace. Yeah, so the mining reward on, uh, or the fee fees on each block are uh, are fairly high right now. Uh, so um, just to take an example, block 630403 had 1.61 Bitcoin in fees. Uh, that's again 6.25 in subsidy. Um, that's like 20 percent or uh, a little more than that. So um, that that's a significant part. And this is the fee market that uh, Bitcoiners have been uh, talking about for a while. Um, you know, another two happenings from now. Um, you're you're probably going to see fees and uh, subsidy be about equal, or the fees being slightly larger. And that's, that's a situation you want to come to when people ask, like, what happens when the subsidy goes away? Well, this is what happens. It's the, the fees are supposed to take over and they're supposed to com compensate all the miners. Um, everyone that's paying fees are then incentivized to try to lower them by more efficiently using the block space by using stuff like SegWit um, and hopefully Taproot when it's available and, uh, you know, like uh, batch transactions and all these other techniques that are going to be available. So um, that, that's, uh, that's, that's a very good thing. Jimmy, one quick follow-up. Does it worry you how many miners are Chinese? No. That it's so uh, centralized I mean, in one country. I don't know if it's centralized. So uh, the pools are in China. The biggest pools are in China. And the, the way the economics of pool, pooled mining works is the whole point of a pool is to reduce variance on your output reward. If you are solo mining, then you would get 6.25 Bitcoins every once in a while, but it would be very infrequent. Uh, but if you pool it, then you reduce variance and you get a smaller payout on a regular basis, which is what you want. Um, I suspect that uh, uh, certainly a lot of the pools are in China, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all of the mining equipment is in China. Even the big mining mining players are, uh, you know, tend to be in different jurisdictions because it depends on where the energy source is. So I know, for example, that there's a big, uh, you know, Bitmain operation in Mongolia because, uh, you know, they, there's a you know, a source of energy and uh, the climate is pretty dry. So it's good for the equipment and so on. So, um, you know, depending on, and, you know, there are lots of places in the world like that. They may have, uh, they may be using the Chinese pools, but it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, they're all in one location.
electrification. Now that said, there is a lot of uh, mining power in China, um, but you know that's been the case for a while, and it hasn't really caused that many problems so far. They did sort of have quote unquote like banned mining or something like that, and then we found out. A uh, short time later, a lot of that equipment ended up moving to the United States and Canada, um, in which case, you know, like they're taking advantage of the things there. So as more economic opportunities for energy arbitrage uh, pop up in the world, I expect that to get more diffuse. So, um, yeah, that that's that's ultimately, I think, what's going to make the whole thing better. I'm also looking forward to Stratum B2. We should make uh, pooled mining a lot less centralized. So um, basically anyone that's participating in pool mining, they get to determine the block and not the pool itself. Um, and that that will uh, make it so that you can have the variance reduction of a pool, but you don't have to necessarily, um, you know, you, you get to create the actual block and not the pool. And that, that would be a wonderful thing for decentralization. Thanks, Jimmy. That's very interesting. One quick note to you, Tone, before you go to price related. You and Jimmy have talked uh, previously on very recent shows about mining pre having if they will be hoarding coins after the having, which sometimes my understanding is that could be precedent. And will they sell just at opportunistic points? And could that be happening soon? What are your thoughts just generally? I know you guys have talked about this, so maybe the skinny of your highlights before we move on to price. Uh, sure. So on that front, uh, Willie was saying something very, very interesting uh, during that epic 12-hour live stream, which was insane. And uh, Willie's views were, or maybe he heard through the grapevines, that some of the bigger miners were interested in dumping coins uh, in order to take out their lesser competition out of business. Uh, clearly, we have not seen that as the price of Bitcoin is rising. And uh, if the price of Bitcoin keeps rising, then it becomes, again, game theory. Like, is it really worth it for you to take the risk in dumping these coins and then having Paul Tudor Jones and other hedge funds just buy them up and the price of Bitcoin goes higher and you're the one that ends up going out of business because you went because you took on, let's say, a bunch of debt to dump coins to wipe out your competition while wiping yourself out. So it becomes a really interesting game theory situation. Uh, this is where I try not to do fundamental analysis. I kind of keep it in the back of my mind as a possibility. And until there is actual evidence and not just hearsay, uh, I'm not going to act on it. So uh, the rumors have not yet materialized and we will see what happens. Uh, the TA tells me not to be overly bullish right now, uh, but we're sitting right at resistance and I'll get to that. Yeah, Thanks, John so, and Jimmy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so with respect to that, uh, I mean, it's not an uncommon thing for commodities markets to get manipulated by the big players. Uh, we've seen that in oil with OPEC, for example. What they tend to do is uh, they cut production or increase production to manipulate the price in whatever direction they want. Now, you can't increase production in Bitcoin and you can't cut production in Bitcoin. So really, the only, um, only sort of lever that they have is accumulation and then sell off. Um, and there is, I, I like there. I, I've heard rumors about this, and it might explain some of the historical sort of uh, crazy swings that we've seen in Bitcoin. I've heard rumors that uh, you know miners uh, all sort of like are trying to bankrupt each other, and as a result, they'll all uh, you know the the biggest ones will sort of start dumping, and then that will cause the uh, the price to dump to at such a level as to actually create enough pressure to bankrupt some of these other miners. Um, and that in turn will, uh, you know, put them into an accumulation phase where they can rebuy at lower prices and use that as a sort of a war chest for next time. Now, whether or not that's actually happened is, uh, is you know, kind of speculative, but it's not an unknown thing in commodities markets. And it wouldn't be a surprise to me at all if that's actually what's happened in Bitcoin as well. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, gentlemen. We're Stephen and I are looking of when to buy in. So that has been helpful for our clients. So with that said, 
Uh, tone, yeah, price, you, and gentlemen, uh, wait, I need to wait, jump off. Wait, yeah? wait, 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 wait. Before you get a bunch of really strange question, questions, I know who Steven is, but people are watching though. Please. Okay, great. Really quickly. Um, my partner is incredible. Under Exponential, we have built a new asset management firm. Steven, uh, he was a portfolio manager at Guggenheim, massive portfolio genius, and then went Bitcoiner and structured uh, one of the closed end funds that Galaxy bought, then started Arca. Um, Arca wrapped up an ETF a very interesting way. Um, and yeah, so we're looking of you know when and how to buy into GBTC and uh, new news to come. So thank you for for letting me uh, show my partner there, Tone. Yes, Incredible uh, Leah joined partner. the new fund, right, gentlemen. Uh, as a uh, and we will bring on uh, Stephen and Leah on the show uh, sometime in the near future, and we can talk about their fund. Thank you. And I, Jimmy, you have to be on with your economics genius as well. Um, so that'll be fun. Guys, I've missed this whole, so much. I can't wait for this to continue. And I need to go to work. <laughs> so Tone, I'll be listening. And thank you, guys. Hey, thank you, Leah. We're going to take a quick thank you, Leah. Uh, and uh, we're going to let you guys go. We'll try to keep these shows to an hour next time. But it's our first day back. We're all excited. We had a bunch of stories. And uh, let's take it from here. Uh, so before I go on to the price, uh, I know we kind of teased you guys a little bit with those uh, videos with 200,000 views unveiling Adam Baka Satoshi. I spent the entire day putting together notes from those videos and each one has a timestamp in that video. I will release my notes uh, tomorrow in the video where I'm gonna go through all three episodes and I'm going to give you my thoughts along the way. I have 33 notes. I know it's a weird number, but I wasn't really trying to come up with an even number of notes. Uh, so I have 33 notes that I want to talk about when it comes to the three-part series. Most of those notes are about episode three. Episode two was kind of useless. You don't even have to watch it. Uh, episode one kind of, you only have to watch episode three. I mean, one and two were like uh, useless. So uh, I'll bring that to you guys tomorrow. Uh, Jimmy may stop by. I'll talk to him about it. I don't know if he's going to want to sit through watching all of them with me on camera. Uh, but if he wants to, uh, Jimmy is, of course, welcome. And I'll try to get another guest if I can. Someone very interesting. Uh, not that Jimmy isn't, but someone else that hasn't been on the show that I find interesting. Hey, so the one thing that we talked about, Jimmy, that uh, came through while I was on the air is we're about to lose a lot of our privacy. And look at the yays versus nays on this disaster, okay? Uh, thoughts just off the headline. Yeah, so I, I believe this is an extension of the Patriot Act. Um, so there, there's a, the FISA court is a, a complete, like, I, I can't believe that this is like even considered in a democracy that you, you could have something like uh, a FISA court, which is accountable to like a few people, but you, you don't get to know what they decide on or what they, uh, you know, had a trial about, but it's like all binding and stuff like that. It's crazy that they uh, sort of snuck this in. Uh, in the midst of this crisis to, um, you know, like under the noses of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the American people. But that's, that's what and this never, is. Never let, a, never let a good crisis go to waste. And Ugh. this is a direct violation of the Fourth Amendment. Like I wasn't even born yeah. in this country. And this is a direct yeah. violation of the Fourth Amendment. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's, um, yeah, uh, I, I I don't like this, but I mean, what can what can you do? They they don't they don't really represent you. They they represent like big businesses so, or so this their is, this government is the agencies question, or something. Right? Yeah, this is the big question. Like you asked the the right question, and we're not going to get into it on this show because we're way over time. What can you do? Well, like like what is the plan to like wipe out permanently your own search history? Uh, don't answer it right now. We're going to tease our audience, but we will be answering that question. Hopefully, there is an answer to this question on the Bitcoin tech show. I'm like hyping up the new show. <laughs> Do you have an answer to that question, Jimmy? I, I have an idea. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. All right, guys. Hey, before we get to the price, please support 
uh, on the Tone Vase website. I also want to show Jimmy's website as well, but please support uh, the uh, with the affiliate page, tonevase.com affiliates. Uh, don't be scared. I will continue to do Bitcoin and price analysis shows. I just won't be trading myself. There might have been some confusion on this morning's show. I will be exiting all my trading. I've been consumed by trading the last month and a half, and I have not had a very enjoyable life while in quarantine. I've been borderline miserable. I find these shows a lot more interesting. It's irrelevant how much money I made, how much money I lost. Uh, like I tell people, worry about what you're doing with your money. Don't worry about what others do with their money. And uh, I am going to spend more of my energy uh, on Bitcoin evangelism uh, and less energy on looking for trading opportunities. But hey, if you guys want to watch, as long as people are watching the price analysis shows, I'll bring you price analysis shows. I mean, I'm here for you guys. Uh, but as far as how I'm spending my time, it'll be more spending the entire day watching every second of those three ridiculous videos. Uh, <laughs> but that was still more fun than sitting there watching Tesla stock go up every penny. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, let, let's go. To, oh, yeah. Wait, Jimmy's website. I need to have just a link to your website here. I'm going to redo this page. I don't even like it anymore. Uh, so, Jimmy, can I get to your website from here? I don't think so. Uh, just programmingbitcoin.com. That's, okay. that's it. Yeah. <laughs> So this is my website. Um, you know, we I have my two books, Programming Bitcoin, which is for developers. If you are, if you know some Python, you can learn uh, Bitcoin at a protocol level uh, using Python. I also have the Little Bitcoin book, which is available in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. We are, um, you know, we're we're planning on a lot more languages that will be coming very soon. But this is a book for your no coiner or pre coiner friends. Um, yeah, you know, it's a it's a very quick read. It's about a hundred pages, and you can read it in one sitting. And it's it's about Bitcoin. What's wrong with money? Uh, it's a it's a very easy to read overview of what is going on. Yep, and I got them both right here for you guys. I know it's a little tiny corner up there, but uh, one of these days we're gonna do this before my camp, my before my screen share comes on, and uh, <laughs> I'll, 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 on my bookshelf. I just have another, I, I'm actually pimping out my backgrounds, man. This is what happens when you're in quarantine. You end up on Amazon buying a million things, but that's all. <laughs> I got to, uh, I, I got to, I got to use that Embly card. Well, though, actually, technically, I don't really, I don't really use that Embly card online. I use that Embly card only in person to start a Bitcoin conversation. All right. Uh, also, uh, any webinars? Uh, or no, no, not not at the moment. Uh, I, I might have an announcement in a couple of weeks uh, with uh, with the new project I'm doing, but right now I, I don't I don't have anything yet. All right, uh, guys, I have to restart my computer right before the show, and ironically, YouTube went down as the show started, and that's why we had like no viewers for the first 20 minutes of the show. Uh, please uh, go back and watch the beginning if you can. Of course, like and subscribe. Uh, we're going to bring you the new show, ideally two to three times a week. It's not going to be daily, and uh, but the law show is coming back and the tech show is going to start. Okay, I am still th on the bandwagon that this is going to be a rejection for Bitcoin. I will continue to believe this is a rejection. Wait, wait, is, it, is that the right price? Because it's at 97.50 right now. It's not the right price because this updates once a day, and I think it's going to update in two minutes. Uh, so this is uh, the Brave New Coin Liquid Index, BLX, and BLX only updates uh, once a day. Uh, but it's just a clean chart showing you this. It's also a weekly candle, and uh, the candle will solidify on uh, Sunday evening. Uh, but this is more like a general observation that I'm expecting this vicinity, uh, this general vicinity between 9,000 and, say, even uh, 11,000, but... 9,300 at the close, uh, which it means by Friday, uh, to hold back Bitcoin. And until Bitcoin proves to me personally, this is just me, this is my personal opinion. Bitcoin doesn't have to do what I want it to do or what I think it should do. Uh, in my personal opinion, 
Bitcoin needs to prove to me that it can surpass this critical area of resistance. And this is a very critical area of resistance. Now, everyone is looking at this area of resistance. Of course, everyone is looking at it because I've been talking about it forever. Uh, and prior to myself, Tyler James was talking about it, but it doesn't matter. Everyone is looking about at this area of resistance. And when everyone is looking at an area of resistance, that resistance tends to break. And I fully understand that. But I still need the price of Bitcoin to prove to me that it's going to break it. Until it does, these are the arrows that I am going to consider. This is where the weak miners finally capitulate and give up and the system becomes more efficient. This is also where the shit coins will start to die. So this is what I'm looking for. It's going to be a critical point for me uh, going into October. All of this changes if Bitcoin spends more than a few weeks above $10,000. Now, let's look at the same exact chart, but this time with the updated price. This is also a weekly look, uh, but this time around, it's the, op it's the updated price. We can also look uh, damn it, I didn't mean to hit that button because those arrows randomly showed up. Uh, let me put this back down. So let's look at the RSI. The RSI is very, very bullish uh, for Bitcoin. Let's look at the MACD. The MACD is not very, very bullish, but the MACD is certainly bullish. And if we look at the CMF, CMF is a problem. CMF is telling you to be very, very careful. CMF continues to decline. Uh, CMF reached its peak. Uh, in June, it made a lower peak in February, and now it's barely making a peak at all. So the CMF is telling you there isn't that much money flowing in. The CMF stands for change in money flow. So there isn't that much money flowing into this current upswing, and that is not good. Uh, if we swing a little bit higher than the prior swing high, and the CMF is this bad, that is very clear divergence, and that's not what you want. Uh, now, the RSI may or may not be divergent at that point. And the, sorry, that was the MACD. And this is the RSI. The RSI will not be divergent if we swing higher, uh, but the MACD still could be, and the CMF probably will be. We are on a six of nine sequential. So I am still looking for potentially three more weeks of upside, but that upside doesn't literally have to be upside. That upside could be downside because Bitcoin could fall back for the next three weeks from here, as long as it stays above 8,900, I will get to see that nine. So Bitcoin will could consolidate, it could rise, or it could go down a little bit. Uh, obviously, it could do anything at once. Uh, the daily is going to close uh, any second now, but this is the weekly. And the weekly still has three days to go. I am anticipating this uh, resistance to hold unless proven otherwise. Here's the uh, Tone, could you go back to the previous one? Um, are, are, if it breaks above the 0.764 Fibonacci line, are you bullish? Um, I'm not necessarily bullish. If it, so, okay, so it's not about breaking this Fibonacci line. It's about closing above that Fibonacci line. So Okay. Uh, going uh, no, up, I, I meant the line above that one, the 0.764, the 11.56A. Oh. Um. Man, that, that, that's a loaded question because <laughs> uh, it depends on how fast. Like here's an example. If, we, if, I wake up, if I wake up tomorrow morning and the price of Bitcoin is 11,500, I'm not going to be too happy. Not because I don't have Bitcoin. Uh, that's not the reason. It's because it would have gone up in an unsustainable way. And I would maybe be short-term bullish, but I would then be extra intermediate-term bearish. Because if we overshoot, we then going to undershoot. We overshot when we went to 14,000 back in June and look how badly we paid for it nine months later, okay? So just going there is not enough. It's how you get there. Now, if we get here, say in October, in an orderly fashion, I would be very bullish across all time frames, uh, like mooning. But if we get there tomorrow morning, I'm not going to be very happy uh, because I will be expecting some kind of an unreasonable capitulation because this would be an unreasonable rise. Does that kind of explain it? I think so. Um, I, okay, so somewhere between now and October, you wanted to hit that point but well not, not between now right like i wanted i don't i wanted to go there sometime more like between september and october 
not okay. but not like too early like, like bitcoin has already gone up too far too fast and it needs pullbacks like if you go back to 2017 2017 run the giant run up in 2017 had some you know reasonable pull uh pullbacks along the way here's a 30 percent well even before that uh coming off the lows uh here's a six to nine months consolidation here is a four, 30 to 40 percent correction here is a 30 percent correction here is a 30 percent correction here is a 30 to 40 percent correction uh and i felt this one wasn't even big enough considering how much we went up before we turned 30 percent correction this one was just fine because we didn't go up as much uh this one was a little bit shallow still a 20 percent correction but a little bit shallow on this one and went parabolic and paid for it okay mm -hmm. so uh, and then look we go parabolic with no corrections at all and then look how much we paid for it you want a correction we've now gone so far up we've had no correction we've had a correction within a single candle for maybe 15 to 20 percent that's not enough that's not enough for an orderly market to new all-time highs so unless we have a reasonable pullback i'm going to be very very concerned of further upside at this moment in time hmm. makes sense okay uh let's go to the daily chart uh, daily chart, the BitMEX funding rate is slightly favoring the bears. Uh, now we are on a green two, but we are not yet above a green one. This is going to be very, very critical. Uh, as long as the green two doesn't go above a green one, I have absolutely no reason to be bullish in this market. I am assuming that Bitcoin is going to get rejected off the trend line. The first element that makes me doubt the fact that uh, Bitcoin will break, uh, will be rejected by the trend line. So the first uh, bullish sign that Bitcoin is ready to challenge the break of that trend line is a green two above a green one, not only intraday over the next 24 hours, but also on the close. Uh, I guess half a step is uh, a touch above this high and a full step number one is to close above it. Now, step number two is the weekly close above it. And step number three uh, is uh, the following candle, making you yet uh, a higher high on a weekly candle. And then by then you can start to become bullish. And of course, step number five is multiple weekly candles above that trend line. So you can take, uh, so, so those are my steps to anticipate new all-time highs sometime this year as of right now uh, there is zero reason for me to anticipate or assume that trend line is going to break yeah but that that candle is only 40 minutes old so it's possible that yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That. correct that's why i said over the next 24 hours yes yeah uh the four hour chart uh the four hour chart is looking very bullish we hit our nine we slowed down we had a green one above a green nine and now we are working on a green two that could potentially be above a green one that could potentially be above a nine with the setup trend law with the setup trend resistance line uh, right there so once again if bitcoin is going to get rejected by this trend line it needs to happen now because this is where it starts this is where the four hour chart uh, starts to turn bullish the cmf is beautiful the rsi is a little overbought but okay and the MACD looks very, very good. So if Bitcoin is going to challenge these highs, it needs to do it somewhere on this can this four-hour candle or the following four-hour candle, because then this time frame turns. And uh, Jimmy wasn't. Uh, 
I don't know if Tone is gone or not. Um, I'm not even sure if I'm live right now. Tone? Yeah, I think uh, I think we seem to be a little bit stuck. Are you there? That, was, that, that one was on me. Uh, that was my internet going out. But okay. uh, tech difficulties all day. Probably tells us that we should be uh, wrapping up the show in a minute. Uh, but I hope you were entertaining uh, the audience as I pull up my new favorite time frame, the uh, 479 minute uh, candles. <laughs> and uh, I was just making fun of random uh, time increments because people keep asking me to look at like time increments I've never freaking used in my life. And I wanted to pick a random prime number. <laughs> and I did. And this prime number turned out to be beautiful. It was topping us right then and there on a nine and it bottomed on a nine. And the previous top was on a 913. And I, this will now be my new favorite time frame. <laughs> How much is 479 minutes? That's like it, what? It, it's actually about it's like six hours. <laughs> Oh, almost. It's uh, two minutes away from eight hours. So it's like yeah, it's seven hours. hours and 58 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> or 59 actually, minutes. Yeah, right, 59. So 59. Uh, you're right, 59 minutes. Um, I actually didn't even know that because uh, I had to like, I just use my calculator. Like, hey, how many hours is that? And that's one minute off eight hours. So, so maybe the eight hour is the right one. I don't know. Yeah, so, so come to think of it, um, all I had to do was just, you know, round to 48 and divide by six. And that would have been simple math. Uh, you would think someone with a master's degree in math should have been able to figure that out. But what you, what you will learn about PhDs in math, they can't do simple math. Uh, <laughs> what, what, once you're at a PhD math level, you ask them like a simple math question, like five times eight, and they're going to pull out a calculator. Like, it's just like... <laughs> I, I, I've learned that being around math PhDs. It's actually kind of funny. Uh, okay. So anyway, uh, that's it. I don't really, uh, the S&P 500, I honestly, I, I was going to get out of my positions. I got into gold. Uh, talk about tone not trading anymore. I got into gold because it did exactly what I said it was going to do. Uh, just as I ended the stream, I didn't get a great entry into gold because I was still freaking streaming. Uh, when and couldn't get my broker up in time. But gold did exactly what I said it was going to be. Uh, I said that, hey, once gold breaks this green line, I am very, very bullish. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, several people took the trade and they've done very well today. Uh, I got in a little bit late uh, due to, uh, you know, busyness. Uh, doesn't mean that the trade was bad, uh, but my trade is still profitable. Uh, that was my gold trade. I am going to cut back on uh, trading quite a bit. I couldn't believe the market rebounded. Thank God I was too busy uh, watching and taking notes of the Satoshi thing. Uh, and I never actually got rid of my positions like American Airlines, which was crashing this morning, but it rallied pretty nicely uh, the rest of the day. Uh, so my positions actually didn't do that bad, but I was getting really nervous down here. Uh, I was happy that I didn't exit those. I'll be exiting tomorrow, most likely. And uh, that's it, guys. Uh, this has been a long video. Uh, we're going to try and keep these shorter for you. Unless Jimmy has some more questions for me. Uh, we can't take audience questions, unfortunately, because we've already gone on for too long. Uh, and on this note, I'm going to end screen share. Uh, but if Jimmy has a question or two for me, I'm happy to entertain. All right. So uh, let me just get this straight on the conditions for you being bullish. Uh, you want an orderly uh, rise up, I guess, uh, towards like that 11,000 area. Is it clear air above 11,000 if we get up there orderly? Look, FOMO can always set in, right? Like mm -hmm. another big hedge fund could start buying in. Right now, I am looking for a rejection and a pullback. Uh, once we get that pullback, I'm a buyer. Uh, I mm -hmm. felt that the pullback to 8,200 was very, very quick, very, very brief, didn't give me a chance to get in the market. And uh, not because of that. I, don't, I, I still think that we need a bigger pullback. So at the moment, I'm actually not short-term bullish. At the moment, I am in take your profit zone. Now, mm -hmm. I already took my profit. I took my profit at about 9,000. Now we're sitting here, and I did that over a week ago. Uh, now we're sitting here at a little bit higher than where I took my profit. But I'm still looking for a pullback. 
it's going to be very difficult for me to get back in if we don't pull back, if we keep going higher. I don't know at which point I'm going to get in because the moment I get in at this point, it's going to pull back and pull back hard. So I'm going to stay patient and I'm going to wait for a pullback. Now, um, the only way that I would still be bullish without a pullback is if we spend the, the next three to four weeks just straight up consolidating. But the other problem is if we spend the next three weeks consolidating, then we hit a weekly nine still at resistance. So that once again makes me expect a pullback. I'm just not buying the bullish case short term. I am very bullish long term. If you have a long time horizon, this is the time to get in. This is the time to dollar cost average. Uh, now I'm already in. Uh, it's just hard for me to be like, I'm looking at the TA and it's hard for me to be short term bullish. I've been short term bullish this whole time from 3000 all the way until now, from March 14th. I've been short term bullish the whole way. I stopped being short term bullish last week because we literally went from under 4,000 to over 10,000. And that's, it's time for a pullback. Uh, that's why I don't see it. it, it it's just, uh, it doesn't matter what the market is. I know Bitcoin is different. And because Bitcoin is different, I'm overweight Bitcoin in my hodl position. But as I, uh, just looking at the chart, ignoring the fact that it's Bitcoin, it's a little toppy at the moment. Okay. So you're, so you want to see uh, if, if it's going to be bullish, you want to see the weekly close above the trend line, daily close above the trend line before that, um, a two above a one, and then, and then you'd be bullish. Yeah. And, and, and I need all that in an orderly fashion. So I needed mm -hmm. to just trickle up uh, mm -hmm. to 11,000 and establish uh, not a new base level, but a new like slight incline. And then I will consider uh, the possibility of a breakout. But if we move tomorrow to 11 and a half or 12 or 13, I may like dig into that total stash in order to uh, prepay uh, the rest of the year's worth of bills because I just think it's a little poppy. Mm. Okay. Okay. It's interesting given this macro environment, just uh, just how much money might be entering. And, uh, you know, there's, uh, I don't know if you're paying attention to any of the stable coin, um, you know, like money coming in and people trading on Binance or anything like that. But it does seem like there's more money know, entering. But like we've heard that every week for like three years and we're still <laughs> sitting here 50% from the all time high, right? <laughs> mm, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. Uh, it, it will be interesting though. Okay. Well, that that's, uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm gonna, I'm gonna have, ask better questions next time you do TA so we can, we can figure out how to, yeah, look, it's, how it's to get you to be able. right now. It's a tough environment right now. Like I had easy answers for everyone, uh, prior to last week, uh, bullish, bullish, I'm bullish. Like that was me, uh, all the way from like March 15 after the crash up until last week. And now I'm like cautious, like guys, just mm. like slowly, slowly the roll. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry you missed it. I'm sorry you didn't get in the last three months, but like, this is not the time to FOMO. This is how it ends badly. But I can't prove that because Bitcoin is special. Uh, mm. You gotta try to be in and if, uh, dollar cost average if this is too much. Mm. Well, it's not a bad way to go in anyway. So there you go. All right, guys. Uh, sorry about the YouTube trouble. That was on YouTube, not on me. And uh, thank you so much for watching. I'll probably bring you a price show tomorrow morning. And then tomorrow afternoon is going to be the overview of that Satoshi video. Uh, please check out tonevase.com. Please support with the affiliate page. And Jimmy is going to sign us out. Fiat the Lenda Est. This song is done.